Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Artful TV today. I'm one of the co-hosts. My name is Hal Rains, and the other co-host is Eileen Imperatrice. Hi. And our guest today, our featured artist, is David Willett. He is one of the my favorite uh, artists from uh, Madeira Unified. So I'm glad you're here. Hello there. Good to be here. So Eileen, let's take a look at your work this week. All right, well, I've got some images again to show you of uh, some past artwork that I've done. And uh, you'll see an evolution of pieces that I did for a series called Selective Memory. Uh, so let's take a look at the first image coming up here. This is called Mistaken Identity. And all of these pieces, what I challenged myself when I was creating this series, it was back in 2013, and it was uh, a show that I was doing, a really large show in a gallery here in Fresno. And uh, they asked me to put together this big solo show. And so I wanted to do a special series just for them. And I decided to challenge myself in the way that I approached the art. Instead of having everything completely planned out for the show and for the series itself, I had some general idea of the images that I wanted. But then when I actually went to Canvas is when I started to plan it all out there. And so figuring out where the image would go and the coloring and the painting Everything that went into it as part of the process of creating it was done on the spot. So I was working more intuitively on purpose. And this piece, Mistaken Identity, dealing with the feeling of being mistaken for different things in life and having to work against what other people may have preconceived notions about individuals, uh, whether it be women, men, or anybody in between, and then also just based on ethnicity and uh, all those things that fall into categories where people make judgment calls. So this is a piece dealing with that. And as you see, the uh, blue is mixed in, uh, you know, more abstractly within the whole piece. And that shins uh, the whole image through the series is that I've done with this series. And so you'll see that in all the other paintings that I have. The next piece coming up is called Limbo. And this was relating directly to the feeling of not knowing what to expect when we were preparing for my husband's kidney transplant. Uh, there was definitely a sense of being in a state of limbo through all of it because as much as we could uh, arm ourselves with information on what we needed to do to prepare ourselves, there was still not knowing how things would work out. And so there was that constant state of, of medical limbo and not knowing how our lives would turn out. This piece, of course, you see a lot of orange and yellows mixed in with grays. And uh, again, there's always that white behind. And I've done several layers because I always started out my paintings, painting the canvas completely black first. And then uh, with the white involved and then using China marker to create the faded image that you see of a person in the background sitting up and then also leaning forward with their head in their hands, uh, dealing with the emotions of that. So the next piece coming up now is called Not of Sound Mind, and another image of a human figure with their head in their hands, just dealing with all of the chaos of what we go through at any given time in our lives and the emotions we have to deal with in um, trying to get through that. And so Not of Sound Mind is very relevant to anyone going through any kind of trauma or any kind of emotional experience that they feel not themselves completely. And Although we can bounce back and certainly um, deal with whatever it is we are challenged by and whatever struggle we have for, uh, in front of us, we definitely feel at times lost in the chaos and lost in whatever is surrounding us in that moment. The next piece is called uh, Nothing More. And this really speaks to that overwhelmed feeling we have when we are going through crises, when we are just dealing with too much coming at us at once. And it's so many things that are piled on to us that we just don't feel like we can handle it. And so we've got a situation here where I've got the human figure and you can barely see that on all of the limbs there are actual tree limbs that are branches that are coming out of them. And so it's the feeling of being overwhelmed and having just too much to handle at one time. We often think, I believe, that we wish there were more than a, one of us at one time to deal with all the things that we have coming at us. But at this point, you know, it just feels like when you 
have that overwhelmed feeling and you just say, I can't handle anything more. So that's where this piece comes from. And then the final piece I'm showing to you today is called Categorize. And again, a figure that is going through a lot of stuff. In often the case with people in situations of uh, either color of skin or gender, we find ourselves put into a category based on what other people think. And we feel boxed in. And so that's why there's boxes on the head and hands and feet of this person feeling like they cannot break out of whatever category other people have put them in. But in reality, of course, through that struggle, we learn to be more our true selves and realize that no one can put us into a box. No one can say that we are only limited to what they think we have available to us. And certainly through history, we've seen plenty of people who then are able to create those extra lim uh, reducing of limitations on all of us. And then we can go forward and actually achieve greater things no matter yeah. what our station in life is. So it's just, you know, going through all the emotions that you feel as an artist myself. Personally, I feel like I have to be very honest with what I create my work to be. And so I always try to put in the depths of the emotions that I have at any given time. And it helps me get through the situations and then also helps me create something that becomes relevant to other people going through things themselves. And that's what I found with this series. When I put the whole series on display at the gallery here in Fresno, uh, the response that I've had from people telling me their stories and uh, really relating to their own struggles, it was immense and it was very valuable as a person creating the work, knowing what my journey was in making the piece, but then hearing other people's individual stories, it just adds to it. It makes it so much richer, even for me, because then I realize that it's transcending what art is, you know, thought of in the first place, just looking at a picture, but then becoming even more relevant to so many more things in our lives and people in general. And that's the whole point, I think, for artists is to create things that become universal so that way it becomes greater than even just ourselves. So that's the five that I chose to share today from the uh, series that I did wow. in 2013 called Selective Memory. And um, yeah, that's where it went. <laughs> well, that, that second piece, you know, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, stay here for just a minute. Talk about but it. that second piece you did where it has, uh, you know, there you go. The, the, the individuals in the chair, it's like there's a right. larger body with the, with the head at the top, and then there's a smaller one, almost child size, and then they're d down the bottom in the middle of the right. kind of um, golden. It's like there's another little person there. And then try off well, to, the, to the little girl. I just well, saw I think the way that is. the way even and feel about that because, uh, again, as I said when I was describing it, it's the idea of ourselves, you know, being alert and being aware of what we have to do. And so that's the figure sitting up. And then the figure with yeah. leaning forward with the head in their hands is dealing with the emotion of it. And so right. uh, it, in my mind, was the same person going through both stages of that. But I think it's really interesting the way that you interpret it, because I think oftentimes when we're going through struggles and real trauma, we feel like a child all over again because it's so difficult to deal with that. And we're looking for any kind of comfort and we're looking for help in going through what we are experiencing. So I think that's a very yeah. valid point. And again, it's when I hear from other people what their feelings are when they look at certain pieces, it, it just adds to what I yeah. see now. Well, now we definitely want to see your work. And so you have a new video to show us today. Yeah, I do. Mine is, uh, I, I wish I could tell you I had something very cerebral. <laughs> You know, when I look at your work, I always think, wow, you know, mine is more um, practical. It's, you know, somebody who hasn't uh, done the different pottery techniques that I have. So yours is always this ethereal stuff and mine's more, okay, let's go grind up some beans and, you know, make some stew. <laughs> well, yours is more spiritual. <laughs> so, yeah, let's take a look at mine. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Hal Rains here. I just want to go over a couple things with you. We're going to talk about a few basic things, okay? 
First, you know about wedging. You've got to wedge the work. When you're going to pull the clay after you've wedged it, then you want to pull up and then push it down and pull the cone up again and then you can start working with your shape. And then I'll pull those walls up as much as possible. Here I'm using a round rib. This rib is really helpful to give you a smooth bottom on bowls. And you always want to check the bottoms of your pieces. 3 eighths of an inch is a good thickness. When I started with the clay, it was pretty soft. So stay with me, let's see what happens. When you've been working with clay for a while, you kind of get a sense for if it's becoming too squishy. Even as I'm working with it, you see the water kind of uh, beating up on there? Some people think that's a really great idea, but uh, perhaps it would have been if this clay hadn't been so soft. At about this point, typically I would let the clay rest. Now by rest, I mean you could just simply set it aside and come back to it an hour or so later, or you could use a torch. So instead of using a torch, I just kept working. Not a good idea, but I did start with a, a green rib that gives you medium weight and quite a bit of control, and um, it's just about to get me into trouble. And yeah, it did. Here I go. It's going to crash just about now. I wish I could tell you I listen to my heart or my instincts every time, but I don't. So I find myself in the position of needing to rescue eight pounds of speckled buff that I got saturated. I use a dry mix masonry stain. You can still see there was just so much um, powder in it and I couldn't get it to um, bind the way I wanted it to, so I started slam wedging. Now slam wedging is where you just basically work with the clay, cut it in half and slam it together and cut it in half and you end up with multiple beautiful layers. Aha, so here we go. Did all that work just to get to a fresh start. I started with a little more than eight pounds of clay when I first started the video. And at this point with the additional masonry stain, um, I'm right at eight pounds again, so. Yeah, it was a lot of work, but um, I got the clay really malleable, but also firm enough to hold the walls and uh, lay it down quite thinly so it'd make a beautiful platter. The feel of the clay is different as well. When you've worked with clay for a while, and I'm about five years in, maybe a little longer, you really get a sense for what is right for your throwing skills. As I already said, the clay was soft and I I figured though if I was just careful, um, I didn't rush myself, I would be fine. So I'm being careful at this point. And you can see how I'm poking those little spots. It's basically just the little bubbles that I couldn't get out when I was wedging. Those guys are still determined to hang with me. You can see at this point I'm using one rib at the bottom to flatten out that little shelf and then I'm using a rib on the outside to pull those edges out and flatten as we go. Okay, so the clay's getting a little soft again. At this point, rather than pushing beyond what I know the clay can reasonably do, I'm using the paint stripper and it does a great job of evaporating the excess water off. It just allows me to overall clean up the job as I go and um, again, give me good results. The big lesson today is basically, listen to yourself, listen to your intuition. No one has time to say, that is fantastic, I'm not doing any more. So there we have it. Uh, I'm telling oh, you guys. So you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wish I could say I didn't uh, screw up sometimes, you know, and I was just really intuitive, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> Does that all then make a little bit different uh, pot in the end as well? Does it know that it's been worked with twice? It, it does, yeah. You, you become more mindful of the colors and using that particular concrete stain, it gives it a really warm, bronzy kind of cinnamon color. 
that uh, this looks so much richer to me than normal clay. And uh, I, I struggle always, I think you guys do too, with how much is too much. Because I think you can, we can all do too much to overwork a piece. So it's finding that place where in your head it feels right and you're not doing too much. It was like uh, Marilyn Monroe, they said that she always would get dressed and then take one piece off before she left the house. So yeah. I think that's kind of as artists what we need to do, take, do what we need to and then think, okay, if I do one more, the overall effect might be really bad. <laughs> Which is what happened when the bowl bit the dust. You know, it's like, ah, okay. It's so, so uh, that, again, the artistic huh? intuition that, again, it's the artistic mm -hmm. intuition, and you kind of learn that as you go by trial and error uh, for yourself right. what works in the pieces, whatever medium you're using, and then also in whatever uh, outcome you want for that particular art piece. And so, as artists, we always have to experiment. And I think that's scary for a lot of people. And I think that's why people often say, well, how can you, you know, it's amazing that an artist can do that. No, you, you've got some gift, but it's really just a lot of constant work and figuring it out as you go along. And then some years you realize, okay, this isn't working. So you try something different or whatever. And that's part of the process. And I think that's the most yeah. important thing for artists is they have to be open to the process that whatever happens, either you can make it work or you have to start over again. It's just, you know, but yeah. you learn along the way a lot of valuable things. Right. Yeah. Well, let's at the same I think that's you. why. Go ahead. Go ahead. Say what you're going to uh, say. Oh, I, I was going to say uh, that's why I think on my pieces, why I don't. Uh, really consider them finished. I just kind of say I stopped working on it because I can probably just keep going and going and going until it's basically too much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, again, that's said, what you've learned through the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's that part that says, oh, I do need to learn this that I struggle with. But let's, let's go to uh, visit David's work because I think he's got some beautiful things to show us. And um, I've known him for quite a while, and I'll tell you, this guy is really, really skilled. And you can tell he's worked Thanks. hard to get to that place. So go ahead, take it away. All right. Um, yeah, here's my notes on my process. I have always struggled with how to define myself as an artist. It seems like most artists choose some type of speciality, like painting or sculpture, and identify as an artist through that modality. I do consider myself to be an artist, but I also identify as a craftsman. I have a wide range of influences and enjoy the act of creation itself, whether it be through painting, sculpting, carving, sewing, or what have you. I think that mindset is evident in the paintings that I'm creating for my current book project with my writer, poet Gary Jackson. Each painting begins with one of Gary's poems, which I read through a couple of times and pull visuals from as I read. I sketch the image in my sketchbook and then scan that sketch into my computer and print it out in 11 by 17 format to prep it for painting. After it's printed, I trace the sketch onto my final paper and make any corrections as I go. I'm using a Canson watercolor paper from a larger pad that I've cut down to size, and as I transfer the image over using my light pad, I start to think of how the painting is going to look in terms of lighting and values, and then begin to block out any shadows. I tend to paint in layers, so I need my foundational layer to be fairly dark. I'm using heavy bodied acrylic paints which can be used in different opacities from opaque to being quite transparent depending on the effect you're going for. The ink prevents my drawing from being washed out by the paint layers. I paint using only the primaries plus black and white. 
All colors can be made from different combinations of these five hues. I can apply the paint very thick or water it down and give a watercolor effect to the piece. I try to use color strategically, but often as I'm visualizing the final piece, I just follow my intuition and apply paint wherever it wants to go. If I make a mistake or change my mind about something, I can cover it up with an additional thick layer of paint later. You can see how the color really adds to the drama of the scene that I'm creating and adds energy to the piece. Once the background color layer is done, I can start to add a thicker, more opaque layer on top of it. That helps to push the background back and bring the foreground into view to make all the elements on the page look like they're existing in real space. Not everything on the page is going to be defined as I paint. Some things are left intentionally vague and will look unfinished. To me that helps add emphasis to the main character or action of the scene. While the other parts that I've included are important, they serve more as ambiance and hopefully don't pull attention away from the main image. From here, my work is to continue going around the page and apply paint where I think it's needed. As I go, I'm also looking for places where I can add details or special effects. Much of the fine details are added with colored pencils after the paint is dried. The pencils are an easy way to even out a small section or squeeze color into an area that would otherwise be too small for my brushes. At some point, I decide to stop and set it aside. When I'm done with all the pieces, I'm going to lay them out and see what they need before I can call them officially finished. So all of our pieces have to do with some sort of a choice. And when I say our, I mean uh, myself as the artist and my writer, Gary Jackson, who has created these scenes as I discussed in my video, and then I go through and illustrate sections of them. We call them hybrids, so that the image is telling one part of the story and the words are telling another part. Each of these images deals with a certain character and their struggle and their choice as a hero and uh, the decisions that they have to make as they wrestle with uh, not only their responsibility as a hero, but also they're wrestling with their responsibilities as a human, as a character uh, who is also, some, who is at the same time someone gifted with extraordinary ability abilities and who wants to live the life that humans are born to lead, you know, the ideals of freedom and, uh, uh, creativity in a lot of ways, um, following your own path. Some of the pieces I've done in different ways, trying to show elements of the character without directly showing the action of the piece or the poem. Other times I have shown the full character. This one in particular, I wanted to show the world they live in and this piece is very different in that I'm showing not only the characters, but I'm showing the action. I'm showing uh, kind of heavier paint on the front with this wispy watercolor in the background, the text integrated into the wings of the uh, character in the back. And this piece was uh, the final version of one of the poems which I ended up writing on the walls in the background so it ends up being sort of like his his thought process as he contemplates retirement and thinking about the violence in the life that he's chosen or felt compelled to uh, but they don't always end up 
like this. As I said, my process changes a lot. So while this is more closely related to my current process, uh, you can see I do have like several layers of paint going, heavier paint in the foreground, lighter paint in the back. It certainly didn't start out that way. My original concept for this piece was this one here. So it actually has the same uh, text down below in the moth design. I just had changed things around a lot in order to make it, uh, I, well, originally I had taken it and wanted sort of a different feel to it. He's kind of a Batman type character. So he doesn't have like necessarily superpowers, but he is very heroic. And so we wanted to uh, show him thinking about this life that they've led. And all of these pieces and these characters are leading up to a confrontation with the volcano man that you see here, who was uh, born of fire and is basically a human lava being and he's contemplating his own humanity at the same time thinking about how you're not always able to choose who you are and what you do sometimes it's chosen for you and so you just kind of run with it okay and he is actually going to lead us into our current project which is called black world which is our uh, more um linear progression of poems and images together. Black world, a planet in turmoil, a people divided, five heroes trapped in a world they never made. The quest for power will lead some men to madness. How can a country heal when it's been cut in two? Who really holds the power? All right, and that's what we're working on right now. Well, it's really impressive. And the things that come to my mind, of course, for the process is wondering about the fact that you primarily were working with watercolor and color pencil. Uh, are there other mediums that you use on a regular basis, or are those the primary ones that you tend to use? Actually, I primarily use acrylics, and uh, I'll use, uh, in, in each piece, I may use pencil, uh, watercolors, acrylics, markers, um, different things that I have lying around that I think is going to make some kind of effect. It just depends on what I'm working on at that time. Uh, but actually, um, almost all of that watercolor work is acrylics. So. Well, I definitely want to thank you, David, for being our guest today. It's an amazing body of work, and I know that you're going to continue to expand on that in your future work. And so we really appreciate you showing all of that today, and um, I hope the best for you. And I certainly hope that everyone gets a chance to visit your online galleries of all of the things that you do. Yeah. And uh, then get to experience what we have here, which has been really amazing. So thank you so much today for being our guest, David. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate we, it. Great. And we really appreciate all of you joining us today, too, on Artful TV. And we hope you'll join us again next week or next month when we have another guest. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you.